so good evening to everyone in india and good morning to uh, legendary architect moshe sabdi who doesn't not need any introduction to this audience who is present but it's my honor to today host uh, you and uh, sir mr moshe sabdi and all the participants who are attending from all over the country so uh, so today uh, we are going to have a quick dialogue with uh, architect moshe sabdi which will be moderated by our architect muni ganju and he'll be talking about in search of habitat but i'll just like to take few slides about the background of how this uh, came about so i am chakresh jain i did my architecture but i have not been practicing architecture for last more than 30 years i've been helping users like yourself from the construction industry to use the technology in the construction so as a capricorn organization we have been there for more than 30 years and serving more than 20000 customer across the country and specifically for construction but of course we do a lot more things so uh, we know in march uh, 2020 all of us while watching on the tv news saw this uh, pandemic rolled out and then one of the in india one of the big issue which we saw was the migration of lot of workers so what we saw that as soon as this migrate uh, lockdown was imposed lot of this migrant worker in, and which we don't have an exact number it, but it has been estimated there were about 10 million people who started migrating and india we have about 139 million people who migrate for the work so they started going back because they found lot of uncertainty in their current uh, accommodation and they were not even sure how long it will last so one thing which happened because of this was suddenly people whom like lot of people have been talking about them about them also as an invisible team which is there in the country their visibility came right in front and it became everyone's top of the mind discussion that we have such a huge uh, people who have been working for us but they don't have a permanent accommodation and so uh, and lot of issues got highlighted and we from our side from technology side that okay what can how can we help the situation and that's where we started thinking about that what can we do as capricorn what can we do and we then came up with this thought that these we refer to them as nowhere people because they have been traveling and we want now these other people we need to really uh, bring some solutions so from nowhere we wanted to make them as now here people and we wanted to create a livable space for them which is permanent which is respectable and which is sustainable but most important which is also affordable for them and that's where we started thinking about like how can technology help for the solution from that and we came up with this competition especially for the students by the name design advance and uh, so this competition is still going on and as a part of the competition we thought that when we are going to have so many students come and participate in this competition then obviously we also want to bring some of the thought leader and first we were of course only thinking locally but then with the with some of the like minded people like mr ashok dhawan helped us to even think globally and he connected us to legendary architect moshe sabdi and we requested him and it was very gracious of him to accept uh, invitation and and share his thoughts and share whatever he like to share today with our indian architects so this competition is still on so we are having two part series in this one is thoughts from this uh, global thought leaders and of course we are also doing technical workshop on how to do various things in the various software is what we are running on and the website for this is designadvance.in so anyone student would like to get more detail please feel free to go there so i i know i don't <laughs> moshe sabdi does not need an introduction introduction to the audience they have been all uh, hearing a lot about it so uh, but uh, he is an architect urban planner educator theorist author and over his celebrated 50 years of career sabdi has explored the ess essential principles of socially responsible design through a comprehensive and a human design philosophy his projects include cultural educational and civic institution neighborhoods public park housing mix urban urban center and airports and master plans throughout north south america uh, middle east 
and Asia. So, uh, and for moderating this session, we have another luminary from India uh, who likes himself to be called as Muni Ganju, although his full name is much longer than that. And he qualified from Architect Association School. And since 1967, he has been in a lot of research and teaching. And he's, uh, apart from a lot of other things, I'll, I'll probably leave it to them for more during their talk. But he's presently building uh, with Tibetan refugee a community in Dharamshala to research the practice of sustainable architecture in Himalayas. He's the one who also founded the TVP School of Habitat uh, in New Delhi. So with that, and without taking much time, <laughs> I like to hand over to our friend Muni Ganju to take the discussion forward from here. Thank you, everyone. Yes, sir, you can unmute yourself. And... Um, right. Chakrish, you want me to take over now, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but I, you know, there's some signal issue. I missed the last bit of your introduction. But anyway, uh, I think that really everyone's waiting for Moshe to give his talk. And um, I don't think that there should be any delay in that. So may I request Moshe to please begin his lecture, his talk, presentation. And we will, of course, ask the participants who have questions to uh, post them in the chat or question and answer boxes, so that by the time uh, we come to the end of the presentation, uh, we are in a good position to uh, direct your queries to Moshe for his replies. So, with just that, I would request Moshe to please uh, begin his uh, presentation. Thank you, Muni, and greetings uh, to all of you in India from Boston. Under normal circumstances, I would have preferred uh, to be there in person in some great uh, lecture hall and see your faces and have personal interaction. Uh, but so it is in the days of COVID. I think one thing we've learned uh, is that there is no substitute for face-to-face. -face. We've all been Zooming and doing all kinds of conference calls, but face-to-face -face is, of course, fundamental, I feel. It's been a difficult year for the world. And as I read and I see, it's been particularly difficult for India. I think the pandemic has exposed many faults and cracks and dis discrepancies in our society. It's exposed the disparities in wealth and opportunity within countries and between countries. It has exposed the incompetence of government. The more incompetent, the more severe the pandemic in that, those particular countries. Uh, it has exposed environmental shortcomings. Maybe we knew them before, but we live with them now and we are more aware of them. And of course, the, the failure of our infrastructure system under these pressures. And oddly enough, for us as an architecture practice, it's been a year of affirmation because for decades I've been preaching that we need to connect architecture with nature, that we need to create outdoor and indoor spaces within the environment, that daylight uh, was significant and important, that there's a limit to our resources, that we need to be prudent about it. And here comes this uh, event, mega event, and actually gives us some, I'd call it uh, uh, backwind in our sails in terms of some principles that we have been pursuing. So I'd like to share with you today uh, a journey um, 
as we experienced it, as I personally experienced it in my office over these decades, particularly at, as it pertains to the residential environment. Am I? So I'd like to go back to 1959. I was a student, like maybe, maybe some of you today, and I had the good fortune to have a traveling fellowship to study housing in North America. And I traveled the continent with five other students and we saw all these high rise public housing projects of circa 1960s. And the rest of the country was covered with this spread of suburban sprawl towns. It was clear then that those who were less privileged uh, were being housed in high rise buildings in cities and hated it. And those who had more privilege would move to the suburbs in order to have their own little house with its own little garden. And I came back and for my thesis at McGill, I decided to do a housing system. The, the slogan was for everyone a garden. Prefabricated modules would be placed in a frame. Uh, each unit would have outdoor spaces. Um, it would be able to reach high densities. And yet at the same time, it would have the quality of life that you would associate with owning a house, streets in the air rather than corridors, etc. And then I had the good fortune to be in the right place when the World's Fair came to Montreal and was able to offer an evolution of that concept for the World's Fair. And I'm showing you here first the original proposal, not the one that was built, the original habitat in which a fabric of housing, membranes of housing leaning on each other, sheltered within them a whole community with schools and offices and workspaces, etc. So that in fact, it was the beginning of trying to suggest a mixed use balanced com community, which you see here. And the notions of prefabrications, etc. Uh, were continuing to evolve, as we realized that because we are limited to fireproof materials, the modules are heavy enough that we must make them load bearing, we cannot just place them in a frame. And that gives you a sense, a sketch I made in six, 1963 of the kind of new three-dimensional city with streets in the air and vertical cores serving various levels of the community and being able to pull the ground plane up into the air. And that's a little nostalgic picture that they pulled out of the archive the other day, showing us in 1963, working in the office uh, on the models for Habitat. Well, the government decided to only build one section of this. So we ended up building more of a village than the entire urban complex. But the ideas of prefabrication prevailed. And the idea that for everyone, there will be a garden. And for the community, there will be garden spaces in every level was part of it. This is the building today, 60 years later. It is a heritage building uh, for Canada. And it is, as a community, living successfully, cohesively, and I might I say happily. One of the questions that emerged after we completed Habitat in 1967 is that, is this a model that can proliferate? Is this a model <clears throat> that could be affordable on a wider range? And I have to tell you that this is a question I've been struggling with throughout my professional career. Because there were periods, particularly in the 70s and the 80s, where many said, this is one of a kind. It cannot be reproduced uh, in any way within the marketplace. It cannot uh, become a general solution to high-rise housing. Uh, there were several habitats designed by us in the 70s and the early 80s, which did not come to fruition. But then about uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, we decided to revisit the subject. What have we learned uh, in the ensuing years? How have the urban conditions changed? 
uh, when we thought of high density in Montreal in 1967, we had no idea of the densities that would emerge in Shanghai and Hong Kong and Beijing and uh, Jakarta and uh, Mumbai, just extraordinary densities, the, the trend towards mixed use, et cetera. And so we set up a research fellowship in the office in which we said, let's go back and look at first principles. Uh, for example, can we simplify the structure so it's completely vertical? With vertical shafts, we would uh, make great economies. Uh, and you can see here a much simplified system of vertical uh, structures, panelized system uh, that would nevertheless achieve many of the amenities of habitat. You can see here the way it worked in cross section. But then we said, what about conditions in the heart of cities like New York and other cities where the density might be as much as uh, an FAR of 12 or 14 or 16 uh, floor ratio coverage. Um, and we said, let's tackle that extraordinary density and see what we can do. Do we have an answer to the cities, the, the densest cities of the world? And so we mapped, you can see on the left side, we mapped the, the residential office and retail in, in central New York, in midtown New York. And we reconfigure it, as you can see on the right, into a mixed use arrangement where the office structures are in the base 24 floors, the residential rises above it. There are large urban windows opening between the housing membranes. And you can see here the uh, several levels of public realm at ground level the community spaces and shopping and so on. On the 25th level, a continuous community street uh, and so on and so forth with the advantage of residential being over the offices and creating a very rich environment of private outdoor spaces and public outdoor spaces. And most important, the permeable structure that doesn't create walls within the city, but that you continuously see through it whether you're on the river or the park, it's always permeable. And these are the principles, fractalize the structure to create outdoor spaces, uh, open it up to make it permeable, uh, and try and simplify construction by stacking things conveniently. Well, from research to reality, in the next few years, as that is in the recent years, we have come to realize several projects in Asia particularly, uh, but not only, uh, with those ideas applied to the real world. This is a middle income housing project in Qingguantao, China, on the coast near Beijing. It is uh, now complete, the first phase is completed, which you see here. We're currently building another second phase of equal scale. Um, it is, I'm proud to say, middle income housing, not super luxury housing and it enjoys private and public spaces, generous uh, park spaces, and it has not blocked the city from the sea views behind it because of these large permeable openings. And you see here the kind of individual deck level uh, of the outdoor spaces of the houses. And in Singapore, on a very restricted site, we have a complex, uh, they call it Sky Habitat, 600 residential units. We bridged between the two towers at three levels. The bridges are completely devoted to community space, both playgrounds, swimming pools, community rooms. Uh, some of the units enjoy terraces open to the sky. Others have balconies. Uh, this now has been up for about seven years and it is inhabited with families, with lots of children, and it's a pleasure to see how they've taken to the building and, and taken full advantage of all the communal and private outdoor spaces uh, which have been provided. And this again is middle income housing. It's not in the luxury district of Singapore. It's at the perimeter uh, middle income housing. This is one of the bridges with the playgrounds. 
And you can see uh, how these strategically located spaces become also collecting points for the community, encouraging uh, interaction and community life. And to just show the full range, uh, this happens to be also in China, very different site, a hilly site, not such a great density, but again, the ability to take advantage of the topography and to build with the land uh, housing that enjoys outdoor spaces, terraces, etc. And I wanted to show you something in the context of a historic city and of a quite lower density, but to show that modest densities also de deserve the attention of making them more effective as living environments. This is the Mamilla complex in Jerusalem on which we labored for several decades. The whole area within the slide outside the city wall was subject for redevelopment that we undertook. You see it here uh, 30 years later, residential, commercial, um, several historic buildings preserved as part of the fabric. Um, at the bottom of the slide on the right, you see a, a residential village. And I want to show you that because it's, it's a very basic, simple system of cluster housing, which uh, contain a street. Under the street, there's a deck where cars can be parked. The deck itself is a pedestrian place for families and children to enjoy and to play. There is that sense of shade and enclosure that's appropriate to the climate and history of Jerusalem. And it has also proven to be a very uh, uh, effective and lively community. And in conclusion, I thought I'd show you because you are going to now be thinking about a competition or something which is to do with basic subsistence, with minimal means, with how to make the most with the least. And so I wanted to show you two projects that we've been involved with. The first uh, happened many years ago in Canada, in the Arctic. It is uh, the area where the Inuit people have lived for centuries. They were nomads until recently. And then they were, they settled and they settled in what's called matchboxes. Now, the, the circumstances are severe. Hence, I think the analogy appropriate to your competition. This is tundra, meaning you cannot build foundations because the land does not, the land is thawing and freezing. You're above the tree line, nothing grows. And the Inuits had lived in tents and igloos for centuries. And here they were westernized into these matchboxes. And we were asked many years ago, could we come up with a housing solution that would be more appropriate to this lifestyle and also resolve the difficult technical issue. There's no materials up there. Could something be prefabricated minimally uh, out of minimal means and shipped so that it can be assembled? I just want to give you a sense of the place. This happens to be myself with my parka to give you the sense of desolateness and cold. And there is that landscape in which they have lived. And so, uh, I hope you can make uh, uh, a little sense of this photograph. There's a series of igloo-like houses. Uh, they are octagons with a living space at the center and different rooms and bedrooms surrounding them, clustered together, tied to each other within the topography. You can see that here. Uh, they float over the tundra with the... Uh, pile foundations, actually quite free from uh, the ground. And they are, you can see here the plans, made up of systematized series of panels, which you see here, the entire kit for one 
out. So these are all made of stress plywood, plentiful in Canada. Uh, stress plywood panels, prefabricated, all these can be stacked very compactly and produce this house, which is clad on the outside with a fiberglass gel coat sheet uh, with insulation behind it and a glowing acrylic dome in the center space, which at night in the long, long seasons of the winter would sort of give the house a marker in the landscape as you have perpetual darkness for about three, four months. The other project we're working on currently, and again, it has to do with reaching for the uh, lowest cost strata of housing. And the origin of this project is in a museum that we have been working on, we completed 10 years ago, Crystal Bridges in Arkansas in the United States. And it is a museum of American art where we created a series of ponds down the stream by damming the watercourse. One of the breakthroughs in this design was to build the entire project out of local lumber, Arkansas yellow pine. It's plentiful, it's to totally sustainable. And we found many ways to te technologically innovate and use that material. And that led us to the idea of why not use this timber, which is plentiful and economical in a new technological way these are called CLT panels. They are reconstructed layers of wood that give it extraordinary strength while using the small, uh, very cheap pieces of wood. The smaller, of course, the cheaper they become. And with those panels, we are developing a residential community. The units are modest and small. They range from 50 meters to 150 square meters for a larger family. They're modest, but you see them here. They are 12 feet or four meters wide so that they can be trucked from a central plant. Unlike the ones in Habitat many, many years ago, these are narrow enough to make it on the highway. Uh, they cluster around the land. You see here the simplicity and cleanliness of the production line components, including the various bathroom and, and kitchen cores being sub prefabrications within the system, all in wood, very, very uh, minimalist in terms of materials. And you can see here a range of typologies. We can go up to eight floors with wood in the United States in terms of the building codes. And you see here the range of densities from four and five story clusters linearly arranged on a site as you saw in David's village a minute ago to eight story clusters and all the stacking done in a way to minimize structural stress and to achieve the greatest economy, which you see here in a kind of a fast rendition of the kind of environment that we're achieving. And you will be surprised the densities are quite high, even though this is mid-rise. So I'd like to, first of all, uh, encourage you with your competition. Um, I think that it is always taking you back to first principles when you think how to achieve something with a minimal means. Uh, I'd also hope that this period that we've gone through does not go to waste. What do I mean by that? I mean that you can go through crises and then learn from them and forget. And I personally lived one such experience. Uh, in 1973, we had the Gulf War. There was an oil crisis. Uh, all of a sudden, the United States, which always depends on oil and it's reliable and plentiful, people were standing in line to get gas for their cars and they panicked. 
And then we had for about six months dramatic behavioral changes in the United States. People who lived 30, 40 miles away or kilometers away from their work got new, new residents to be closer to work. People who had big gas guzzling, uh, petrol guzzling cars got compact cars that were more economical. It seemed all of a sudden that this gasoline crisis would bring a reform in the way we use transportation and the way we plan distance to our employment. And it lasted six months and gas got cheap again and everybody forgot about it. And now we have everybody driving these enormous SUVs and the lessons have been forgotten. Well, I hope that the COVID lessons will not be forgotten, that it's, I had a friend who lives in a luxury building in New York, luxury high rise apartment building. It has a doorman and all the trappings of luxury. Uh, and she called me and she said in the middle of the pandemic, there should be a law. You cannot, you shouldn't be able to build apartments without opening their windows. And you should not be able to have an apartment without an outdoor space where you can go and breathe air. And you cannot have an apartment complex that does not have some outdoor space for its residents. Uh, these are the lessons I hope we carry forward. And I wish you much luck in your endeavors. Be happy to have a conversation now and we can be more relaxed and converse about it. Thank you, Moshe, for being uh, very uh, prudent about the time. And, but in the short time that you did take, I think you've provided us with a great deal of material for further thought. Uh, there are one or two technical kind of remarks from people who are asking questions, which I think are quite uh, uh, significant. And that is to do with recording. So I hope the organizers will take note of that, that uh, not only people are asking for a recording of the lecture, but also a recording of the presentation. Amit Goshal especially has asked for, uh, because he seems to think that there's a huge amount of information which you have actually shared with the, with the audience. And they'd like to be able to spend a little more time going over it. So with that technical issue out of the way, the questions which are coming up, Moshe, are quite interesting. Uh, there are questions which deal with the engineering issues and there are questions which deal with, shall I say, the cultural issues um, and some which actually go to um, uh, detail about uh, the, you might even say the, deeper cultural issues. Um, but shall I uh, start with the <clears throat> easy ones, which are the engineering issues, I would say. Um, um, you see, these are to do with how do you make big openings in these kinds of structures? Uh, how do you take care of the construction labor when you have so much, uh, when these huge construction projects are coming up. These are the kinds of questions which are coming up from uh, somebody who's working in the Metro Corporation in Delhi. Delhi, I think it is. Um, but I think the, and what is the role of artificial intelligence and management as well as algorithm-led design so that uh, many, the pains of production are relieved. And, uh, but there's a, there's a rider to that question. Are there any particular design or ethical or moral or humane? You're, you're frozen on me. Munya, I can't hear you. Muni, you're frozen.
Uh, can the others hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yeah, so, uh, I think uh, they my see that. What, what I was saying, saying was that from, from the technical issues, issues uh, this, this question has raised uh, ethical and moral issues. So it covers really the whole range, I think, of what the questions are aimed at. So uh, I'll stop. Broad. Yeah, the questions are very broad, but I'll try and break them down into different components. Right. Um, let's begin with a question of uh, resources. And I have a term that I've used over the years which I think is fundamental to my philosophy as an architect, which is you're always striving for uh, something inherently buildable, inherently buildable. What I mean is we can design every shape and every form that we can imagine. And given enough money and resources, we can achieve the craziest shapes and complexities, etc. But the question ethically is always, is it necessary? Is it worth it? Um, is it inherently buildable? In other words, you might want to do things in architecture that have a cost to them. And I will explain in a moment. But in that case, the burden is on you to achieve it in the most efficient way. So for example, there's no question that fractalizing the building the way we do at Habitat, breaking up the surface to create many terraces and exposures to the apartments has a cost associated with it. The more surfaces exposed, the more insulation, uh, the more exposure of the envelope, uh, the greater the cost. That is why most developers end up doing extruded high-rise buildings as compact as possible, because they're obviously in that way, minimizing the envelope and minimizing the volume and the cost of the building. However, if the payoff is great and you get gardens and openness and ventilation and porosity, then how do you achieve it in the most economical way? In other words, it's not just a matter of economy, it's economy of what? Uh, there was another question raised, which is about technology and uh, algorithms and, and the, the, the punch words of the current technology. Seen from the vantage of architecture, the tools of technology has transformed the way we design and the way we communicate that design to manufacturing. Obviously, our office today here, nobody holds a pencil. I, you know, uh, I come from a tradition where we all drew and erased and erased and drew again. And now it's all computers. I have to go around the office and offer pencils. Try it, it's not so bad. However, that does not reflect in construction technology. When we did the Habitat of the Future research, we said, has something substituted concrete? Is there something lighter, fireproof, stronger, cheaper? Is there anything more effective than steel or reinforced concrete? And the fact is, for high-rise construction, there hasn't been much change. So I hope that in the coming decades, we will see a breakthrough in the actual materials, not just in the methods, in the actual materials. And there's one more ethical question which was mentioned. And I think it's something that, that certainly every architect today building at the large scale must face. When I built the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, we did it in four years. And we did it with 18,000 workers working around the clock, three uh, shifts a day. Well, think about it. 
first of all, none were Singaporeans. They were from Bangladesh, they were from India, they were from Sri Lanka, and they were from China. They were all migrated to do the work there. They all lived in, let's call it, uh, 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 labor residences or camps. Um, and you confront the fact that your large projects and any project today deploys labor and that the treatment of this labor and the conditions of that labor vary greatly around the world. And I don't know to what extent as architects we have influence over that, but it is certainly an ethical question, particularly in those countries where construction is achieved mostly by imported labor. But that's a very broad subject, which is probably beyond the scope of today's uh, discussion. Thank you, Moshe, for uh, taking on the sort of broadside. <laughs> I may tell you that uh, in the last few minutes, there's been a huge number of questions which have come up. And uh, while I'm struggling to put them, to cluster them together, but I think one or two important ones which strike me is the, for instance, the issue of maintenance has been raised by somebody. What is the, how can architecture help in terms of the maintenance issues that are bound to arise in habitat, in housing. So that's one question, which I think uh, requires, uh, well, it's a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a question that's appropriate coming from India. Yes. I, grew up, I grew up in Israel where there was a very poor maintenance culture. So buildings would be built uh, three, four stories high, uh, plaster buildings. Uh, tenants would, move, residents would move in. Uh, these were at the beginning uh, rented accommodations and there was this business of uh, rent controls. Nobody wanted to spend any money on their buildings, maintaining them. And, you know, within a decade or two, the whole place looked slummy because plaster needs maintenance and landscape needs maintenance. So I give you a completely opposite example of a country I've done a lot of work in, is Singapore. Singapore is not as wealthy as the United States and many other industrialized countries. Maintenance in Singapore of anything you can think of is perfect. You, I'll start from the most mundane. Every bathroom is clean. The landscaping of the public realm is extraordinarily ambitious and superly well-maintained. Every person who owns a building must keep it intact, well-maintained, painted. And if they don't, the government comes and does it for them and charges them. The result is that you have a whole city state, which is in a, in a extraordinary state of maintenance. And that is true for all kinds of buildings, including those that are difficult to maintain because they were built with materials that are less, um, uh, less hardy. So I, be, I really believe that, that maintenance is essentially a question of culture. If you come to a little village, modest people are poor, but you see a lot of garbage, you know that it's just a matter of their own labor that could remove the garbage. It's more of a cultural state of mind. And so I think maintenance has much to do with education and policy. And it is a very important subject as we have learned by able to, for example, compare a place like Singapore with Malaysia next door on that subject. Thank you. I think uh, that actually does uh, position the issue of maintenance in a perspective which is understandable. 
we can do something about that. And you're quite right about the maintenance culture in this country, in India, being rather awkward, if I may put it like that. I allow myself um, to be critical because I come from a country that is equally guilty. <laughs> yeah. So, but then there are, there's another set of questions sort of flowing out of this, that which I think is quite interesting, that what is the extent of improvisation that the users, that the residents are um, uh, um, allowed. able to, yeah, allowed yeah. In, in a way able to do. I think that's a very useful. Yeah, good question and one on which we gained experience uh, by simply observing what happened. Um, Habitat uh, 1967 in Montreal was 160 apartments, all fully designed. Um, people moved in, they purchased their apartments. In some cases, as families grew, they purchased the unit next door and combined them. But what we found over the years, it's now over 50 years, that people transform their environments to suit their own needs. Many asked, could they build solariums on their decks? And I said, absolutely so. If the solariums serve you well, go ahead and build them. Uh, we have, our policy has been to give people within the units full freedom. And if you go to Habitat today, you see a whole range of housing in terms of size of units, decor, all kinds of adaptations. One of the things we provided in Habitat that we did not realize had such utility was the concept of a subfloor. There's a 60 centimeter subfloor in the modules that we put in to accommodate plumbing and, and, and the services. But that meant that anybody could come in and change the apartment and move everything about freely. Um, in more recent years, I think of uh, giving people more unfinished space, give them a thousand square feet, a hundred meters, 120 meters, surround it with windows, give them a subfloor with plumbing in it and let them do what they want, uh, whatever they need with their own labor even, uh, which has some advantages. So I'm for self-help and I'm for giving a lot of flexibility and I don't worry about if the architecture profoundly as infrastructure has its kind of uh, bones and presence, uh, it will not suffer from uh, individual variations. Indeed, I think this is uh, uh, really the key the fact that when you talk about first principles, if the first principles are very strong, the architecture has the capacity to be able to undergo, to, to, to uh, tolerate, uh, you know, this, this kind of human in intervention which takes place, especially in housing. So I think there's also a kind of rather uh, important question here from a, a friend of mine, Narendra, who has given giving the background to the idea that <clears throat> that the there is a kind of um, spiritual background to what's going on in this country, which seems to be um, opposed to the Cartesian so-called scientific rational point of view, which has dominated the thinking of modern architecture a great deal. And his question, he says, is having had the opportunity to work contributing to the making of the human habitat and to mold a generation of young architects in the process, what do you consider as your inheritance from the most ancient knowledge of life itself that can be practiced in the making of the human habitat so that it is not fragmented from the reality of wholeness. Now, this is one which I can repeat part of the question, but- uh, The last part um, it is, is uh, you could repeat. The frag 
sentence. The last sentence. What do you consider as your inheritance from the most ancient knowledge of life itself that can be practiced in the making of the human habitat so that it is not fragmented from the reality of wholeness? Wholeness is like, you know, as well, I think. Yes. I, 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 let me reflect on this question. For me, the lessons of the past, the heritage that we carry forward as architects is most embedded in vernacular architecture. Some years ago, Bernard Rudofsky had an exhibition and a book called Architecture Without Architects. I recommend to all those who can still get a copy to study it carefully. At face value, you'd almost think it's like a travel book. Italian hill towns, villages. One thing that's common to them, they're all wholesome environments, uh, adapted to the landscape, to the materials available, to the lifestyle. And what's common to them all is that they were not invented, but they evolved. They're not invented by a single individual. You can't say somebody invented the sari, it evolved. Now people can use different patterns, fabric, silk, cotton, but the sari evolved. That's another form of vernacular clothing. And to my mind, what we observe and learn from vernacular architecture is the most uh, profound because it represents life sustenance at its most basic. So if we say, or ask the question, what does that mean to a modern architect, to a contemporary architect? What does it mean? First of all, it means that as a form of inspiration, we must always be cognizant that some of the greatest architecture is there because it had evolved and not invented. We live in a culture where we're educated that everything must be an invention and everything must be first time and innovative and never seen before and sensational, which in a sense is counter to the wholeness that comes out of evolution. Which leads me to another observation, which is we can insp be inspired by buildings that our colleagues do and present and past. We can go to a cathedral and we do go to cathedrals and to great libraries and, uh, and structures and which inspire us. Um, and as we do that, we should, uh, as we pursue design, I think one object to be in mind is timelessness. A quality of design that sustains itself, that's not a sensation of the moment, is what we should be aspiring for. So for me, the greatest inspiration is to study design in nature. How nature designs in an evolutionary way, in the Darwinian way, in the morphological way, harbors in it some of the greatest lessons as an architect how to pursue a building design. Thank you, Moshe. Um, if I can move on to um, some of the, uh, shall I say, more direct questions, there is some, there is a set of questions around the fact that in the countries which are like India, Pakistan, where you know, there's so much low income population and the, the challenge between the, the transfer between rural and urban is really quite a huge issue. How does one preserve, and you talked about vernacular architecture, but how does one actually preserve the vernacular in terms of which I suppose is what the villages people are used to in the design of the urban habitat? that the migrants are going to have to encounter. 
this is a set of there's a set of questions around this which I've this tried to. A, this is a very very deep question because it has to do with a fundamental body politic and political policy and and economical structure of a country. What India is experiencing, what China is experiencing, is that extraordinary shift from agriculture to urban, from agriculture and rural life to urban life and urban jobs. Now that is a shift that's almost beyond our control. But the physical shift is not beyond our control. And I'll give a little example uh, of an Israeli experience, which began about 100 years ago with the advent of the kibbutz, collective farms. In the collective farms, to begin with, 100, 200, 300, maybe 1,000 people came together to create a farm which, in which they own and work the land together. But the world changed and it didn't need that many people to achieve the agriculture production that they had. It was clear that with new technology, less people are involved in the making of food and milk and so on. And so they made a shift, which is they started creating industries and had the agriculture and had the factories. And I think that one of the mysteries is why as we industrialize rather than urbanize, as we shift labor from agriculture to industry and services, we don't get hundreds and hundreds of towns, not Mumbai 20 million, but towns of 100 and 200,000 people, which <clears throat> combine agriculture and industry in a kind of a way that would avoid this extraordinary influx on you know, half a dozen cities. In Mexico, it's, it's the entire country into three cities. In, in Indonesia, the, these are just extraordinary concentrations, which in fact could be satisfied in a much more dispersed pattern. I think one of the keys to that is effective transportation. The bullet trains of China uh, show you that you can actually be within an hour from one smaller rural city into the bigger cities, which makes a big difference. But also, the, us, the, this would take a real economic intervention by government to say we want to salvage the countryside by helping it urbanize and industrialize without having to be part of the migration. It means bringing medical services, education, all the things people are moving into the city for into the countryside. Yeah. I think you've uh, <clears throat> you've touched upon uh, an extremely uh, important issue here, which you know uh, even some of our very, for instance, Amartya Sen, who is a Nobel laureate in economics, he has been advocating something like this for many yeah, years. But you know him. Yeah, yeah, he lives here in Cambridge. I know him well. Right. So he's been advocating things like this for a long time. But it does seem that to actually achieve this in terms of real life is exceedingly difficult. And uh, uh, the, there is a related question here, which I think is rather important. There are many others which I'm not picking up on, which really I think are not really that important sort of useful, but there is one here, which I think is, how do we design for urban villages? As you know, there is a, a large number of urban villages, which are trapped in the growth of our major cities across the country. 
And this is used to be something which was a kind of exotic thing, you know, something we would look at romantically and all. But of late, the numbers in urban villages has so much increased that it has now become not only a significant political uh, constituency, but also a matter of concern for the policymakers. They are really waking up to it. And I think it would be very useful if you could give us a little insight you're into trying to be a little more urban villages means means in the perimeter of the metropolitan cities or what I'm not clear what you're referring to. Yes, well, you see, in a, uh, it is a both. There are some villages which are trapped within the growth of the what you might call a more uh, central area in the city. But there are also lots of them who are on the periphery. And because you see the city has grown very, very quickly. So and it, uh, it is surrounding these uh, villages. And these villages stay, uh, it, there's no boundary really, but the fact is that it's a very different kind of morphology that these villages uh, show. It's not the, quite the same as the rural village it develops a character of its own. And, um, uh, but the method, the, the, the principle is the same, that somehow the inheritance of village life has found a place to thrive in the urban milieu. And that does raise to my mind, very interesting, uh, uh, an extremely interesting challenge and a real one. Because the, now the numbers of people involved in that, for instance, in, New De in Delhi, maybe one third of the population of Delhi would constitute this kind of what they are often called informal settlements, but they are much more than informal. They have a very distinct form. So, but it is the it is the uh, dialectic between the urban and the rural, which is coming to visible reality in our towns. And I think that's where the migrant laborers go and launch. The ones for whom this competition is being addressed. You know, I'm not familiar intimately with the specific uh, examples that you're giving uh, other than in Delhi a little bit, but my, our experience has been that in those cases, where metropolitan cities have expanded into the rural area. And that's true of China, certainly true of Israel, uh, where the farmers uh, or the villagers owned the land. The normal, normal pattern is that as the city moves in, they sell out for good money to real estate developers <laughs> they move downtown and buy themselves an apartment in a high-rise building. I mean, I've seen that in China over and over. I've seen it in other places. So that actually the expansion of urban areas into the surrounding agriculture areas has generally been transformed by the marketplace rather than by, you know, the just the opportunities to make money for them is is too extraordinary to, to give up. And so they gave up their lifestyle and their environment. I think of more urgency, because th there's a natural kind of organic uh, growth pattern that occurs there. The a more urgent issue to me is small towns and villages not in the sphere of influence of the mega cities. And how do we get investment in them for industry, for jobs, for service and bring services to make them attractive enough to stay in? Because they are outside the sphere of influence. And so if that doesn't happen, that's when people move to the metropolitan cities. And so it means mapping, identifying those areas which are bound to be in transition there might be fertile agricultural areas, but there's not enough employment there to keep everybody busy with agriculture and to, by government initiative, by all kinds of incentives, get industry to move in there and 
other institutions in order to make them sustainable modern communities. Right. Their quality <clears throat> of life would probably be superior if that's achieved than having to move to the crowded, expensive metropolitan cities, maybe 300 or 400 miles away. Yeah. Well, there was a move by the government of India to look at the small and medium towns uh, several decades ago. But for one reason or another, this movement has not taken off. Uh, policy has been put down for it, but it hasn't somehow uh, become the Leo of the big city. And it is an economic issue, obviously. There's somehow the cluster of economic activity in a tight cluster, I mean, to happen close to each other in dense formations, attracts more capital and more economic activity. This seems to be the mindset, which, which the is- mindset uh, It's easier to get labor, that there's more plentiful labor, that you don't depend on a smaller population. Of course, there are. That is why I said you must create incentives. Mm -hmm. For example, tax breaks for those who do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, in a country like ours, the biggest tax break comes when you find ways of earning unaccounted for money, what we call black money. This that is the was, biggest tax people work <laughs> In this conversation. That's not fixed <laughs> <can> here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you, I'm th I mean, I must say that you've covered a huge amount of ground, really, when it, looking at this problem of migrant uh, labor and their habitat, which the students are competing to get a prize in. I think we have gone over the hour by a few minutes, and I would request Chakresh now, the, the, the sponsor of the event, to let us know if he wish to, if he wants us to continue. I think Moshe well, has already covered a huge amount of ground and left enough uh, thinking uh, uh, seeds for the audience to take forward. And I would like to personally thank you, Moshe, for uh, you know extremely uh, uh, direct and uh, honest and revealing answers to the different questions which have come up. And Chakresh, I'll request you to take over now. Yeah. Very, uh, thank you, Moshe. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Amit Jain to give a thank or vote, vote of thank. Moshe Sardi, sir. Tavan, sir. Kanju, sir. Uh, I've been giving this uh, tough task for uh, vote of thanks, actually. I'm speechless. No words to say. To thank you. Uh, it was uh, really dream comes true for our team to be there, to be you be there on the boat. We were uh, planning to uh, have an event with you for I think last six months, and you were gracious enough to accept the demand, our uh, request. And uh, uh, again, no words to say thank you. Uh, and uh, true Indian style, I would say thank you very much, sir. It's thank really you. our honor. All the best. And I think we have uh, almost 400, uh, in fact, 500 plus participants from Indian uh, architectural community. I think they might have uh, gained a lot to see you live. Uh, I heard, I am not an a student of architecture, but still I, I, I you know, I've spent last 30 years uh, working with architects. So I heard, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, architects uh, of our, my generation and even current uh, students of architecture, they dream of uh, following you or maybe, you know, want to see you, want to, you know, listen to you. And I think that was a great opportunity uh, for uh, those who are there today uh, to listen to you. Uh, really, you know, no words further to say. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was really our honor to be there with you today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dhaman, sir. Thank you, Ganju, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Moshe. 
<clears throat> and thank all the participants. We hope you enjoyed. We will be sharing the link to the video of this uh, uh, webinar today to everyone. Uh, so it's been recorded, no? Yes, sir. We have recorded and we'll share the link. Yeah. All the registered people, in fact, uh, I'm sure a lot of people wanted to attend but couldn't attend because of whatever reason. So we'll be sharing with all the registered uh, participants. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.